Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be thinking about where to use non-chord tones or inessential notes depending on which part of the world you come from. They both mean exactly the same thing. Because lots of people come to me and they say, well, I've got this bit of harmony, whether it's a composition or a harmony exercise or whatever, but sounds a bit boring. I'm not quite sure how to spruce it up. So have a look at the thing that I've put together uh, on the screen and see what we make of this. This is a typical example of a sort of bit of four part harmony that works perfectly well, but is not decorated in any particular way. So this is what it sounds like. Sounds perfectly all right, doesn't it? But it's nothing terribly exciting. And just so we're entirely sure what we're doing in terms of chords and, and all the rest of it, well, what are we doing here? We've got chord one, then we've got a chord six, then we've got a chord five, we've got a chord one in first inversion, so you can call that one B, or you can call it one six, depending on which part of the world you come from again. And then we've got chord four, chord five, chord one. So I've done it purposely without any particular kind of fancy harmony. It's all fairly straightforward chord progressions there. But if I want to embellish this in some way, well, what's the best way of going about it? Well, we can use passing notes or we can use uh, uh, passing tones, just get the terminology into, uh, into focus. So passing notes or passing tones, or we can use auxiliary notes or neighbor tones. So again, just depends where you come from, how you've been brought up with your harmony as to what the terminology is. And one way in which you can decorate a piece of music using these things is to look for melodic progressions of thirds. So you take one part, let's take the soprano part for example, and you think where does one note move up or down a third? Well, if we have a little look at this, we notice of course right at the beginning here, we've got G and B in the melody. So G to B is a third. Well, B to D, the next pair of notes, is also a third. We've got another third later on, going from C to A. So whenever we've got one of those, well, there's nothing to stop us putting in passing notes or passing tones. So how would that work? Well, all I've literally got to do is to fill in the space. So if I turn this initial quarter note or crotchet, uh, sorry, half note into a quarter note or a crotchet, then you see how I've created that space. So in the original, we were just going G to B as we progress from chord one to chord six. Now I've just put in that passing tone or passing note. And of course I can do the same thing if I carry on. So if we turn this into a quarter note or a crotchet, and then we put another one in there. Well, see what happens now. In the original we had. Now we've got. Already it sounds much more interesting and we've got a kind of stronger melodic identity going by thinking about doing that in the top part. Now I can have those as straight quarter notes or crotchets. I could spruce up the rhythm a bit. Or, or I could repeat a note before I use the passing tone. So you see lots of different possibilities. Well, you know, how about we just put that one in for now? All I'm doing is repeating that first note before I move on to it. Then I could just make life a bit more interesting here by dotting the rhythm. So what have we got now? And it's got a little bit of rhythmic character as well as a little bit more kind of melodic identity. Okay, well, we talked about another one later on, didn't we? So we could do the same thing here where I could change that C 
into a quarter note or a crotchet and simply put the B in there so we've got a passing tone or a passing note. So remember the important thing about passing notes, passing tones, they have to move by step. So they've got to approach by step and they've got to leave by step. So don't be hopping anything more. So wherever you've got a third and you can put the intervening note in, it works a treat really. So that's where you can look out for possibilities for these passing notes, passing tones. Now again, we've got the same kind of options. You know, in the original version, the last three chords simply did this. Now we've got this. We could dot the rhythm. We could repeat the first note. Whichever you prefer, really. Um, well, let's let's do this repeated first note thing again. It's not a bad idea when you're working through a whole piece of music. If you're going to introduce an idea, like we had that repeated note in the first measure, the first bar, well, let's use that again somewhere later on. But don't do it every time, so you kind of vary things. So you see what's happened now? Just by elaborating that top line, all we've used is these passing tones, these passing notes, to fill in the gaps where we've got thirds. We've thought about different ways of doing that, simply by putting quarter notes in. We've thought, well, maybe we could dot one and half the next one in value. Maybe we could repeat notes. Well, suddenly we've got something much more interesting. So here's the original again. Here it is with the soprano line decorated. Okay, well that works quite nicely, doesn't it? Okay, now you can get carried away with this if you're not careful, because if you do this in all four parts, it can get a bit kind of ridiculous. Uh, so be careful, you don't overcook it, but it's kind of, possibly worth thinking about what you want to do with the top line first um, and then think are there places where I might want to do something in one of the lower parts especially if you're thinking there are moments where it's perhaps a little bit static so for example if you look at the beginning of the second bar well we're sort of sitting on that chord aren't we when we get there well is there anything we could do there well are there any parts that move a third. Well, there are, the bass part. So how about here, we do this where we turn that half note, that minimum D into a quarter note, and then we stick in a passing note. So instead of stopping there, the bass line propels us forwards. And I'll tell you what's particularly good about that one. You always have to be careful in a bass line what impact might this be having on the chords? Is it throwing up any particular difficulties? Well, in fact, this C that I've just put in in the bass enhances the chord because we've talked about chord five at the beginning of that particular measure. But when I put that C passing note, passing tone in, it actually turns the five chord into a five seven chord. So that's kind of enriching the chord. So it's doing two things. It's a passing note or a passing tone, but it also changes five into five seven. It's five seven in its last inversion. So what we call a five seven D chord, but it's a five seven in its last inversion. Enriching the chord actually makes it work very well. Now, keep an eye on the kind of rules of engagement with harmony when you do this stuff, because you can't just put in these passing tones, these passing notes, without certain implications on occasions. Everything we've done in the soprano line works fine. It doesn't cause us any difficulty or any potential difficulty. Because we've put this C in the bass in the second measure, and because we've turned that chord from five into five seven, we then just ought to think about the rules of resolution, because when you resolve a 5-7, the seventh should fall by step and the third should rise by step. So let's just check this out. Because the seventh is in the bass, does it fall by step to B? Yes, it does. The third is in the alto, does it rise by step to G? 
Yes, it does. So in fact, we're okay on this one, aren't we? Uh, so, but you might have kind of tucked that in and then realized that actually the third isn't rising and then there could be just a little problem with that. Um, so be careful with that. Okay, now there are other places where you could put passing notes, passing tones in, like back in the first bar. You can see the bass is going from a G to an E. So is there any reason why we shouldn't do something similar in the bass line? Um, do something like that. So now we get... So you see what we've got there? We've got double passing notes going on now because they're happening in the top line as well as the bottom line. Well, as I say, you can get carried away. You can say, oh, well, if I can do it in the bass, I could also do it in the tenor because I'm going from B to G. So why not do that in the tenor? Does it work? It does work, doesn't it? But you've got to be a little bit careful. Now we're getting to triple passing notes. Is it beginning to be a bit too much? You know, it's a bit like chocolate cake, isn't it? We all, well, most of us like a slice of chocolate cake. And if you've enjoyed the first slice, you might think, oh, I'll have a second slice or even a third slice. And then there comes a point where you think, I really shouldn't have done that. Too rich, making me feel a bit queasy. Well, it's the same when you're decorating your harmony. You can get a bit carried away. Have we got too carried away? Have a listen to the first, first bar, the first measure. It's okay, isn't it? But we're beginning to be a little bit on the border. Why do I say that? Well, when you look at the second beat of that first measure, we've got F sharp, G, A, all sounding together at the same time, three neighboring notes. And that's just something that comes with a sort of musical health warning, I suppose, just to be really sure that you're happy about that. On this occasion, you can get away with it. Would it be better just to do it in the bass? Is that a bit cleaner? It's partly down to taste, isn't it? But it's possible. So it's showing you that there are places where you could have three parts doing this stuff, um, which is, you know, which is great. Okay, now, um, are there other places? Well, there's another place where things just kind of sit down a little bit, and it's just at the end, where we've got these last two chords in the cadence. Now, we don't want to muck up the cadence in any way, but um, there's no reason why we should. We could say, well, the tenor part's falling a third from D to B. So could we kind of slip something in there? How would that sound? So instead of just having 5-1, we've now got a passing note or a passing tone in the tenor. Actually, that sounds quite nice, doesn't it? It sort of enhances it further. And again, it's another example of chord five, and then that C makes the five into a five seven. So it's enriching the chord. Much better to start with five and make it five seven. So you start with plain and you make it a bit richer than to start with five seven and go five. So you kind of weaken the chord. So that's five strengthened by the seventh. Okay, brilliant. We're all happy with that. Just check that the rules of engagement are actually working. Does the seventh fall by step? Yes, it does. Does the third rise by step? No, it doesn't. Ah, is that a problem? Well, we're lucky because on this occasion, it's not a problem. The third normally rises by step, but there's one exception. Oh, thank goodness for that. When we're dealing with a 5-7, the third should rise by step unless, by doing so, it creates a triple root. Now, if this F sharp were to rise by step to a G, we'd have G in the soprano, G in the alto, and G in the bass. So that would be a triple root. If it's in danger of creating a triple root, that third can fall to the fifth, of the next tonic chord. That's exactly what happens here. There's the third of the five seven, and it's falling to the fifth of the tonic chord that follows. So that does a nice kind of job for us. Okay, so we've done a lot of work with passing notes or passing tones, and that really kind of makes a big difference. Just double check this now we've done this. Here's the original.
nothing wrong with that. Perfectly respectable piece of harmony. Now let's put our passing notes, passing tones in. This is what we've now got. And you can hear the impact of that is vastly to improve it. Okay, now what about these neighbor tones or what we call auxiliary notes? They can be upper or lower. Well, the best way to look out for options there is to see if you've got any repeated notes. Well, you know, we have got repeated notes, like for example, there's a G in the alto there, there's a, a G there. So what I could do is kind of, you know, use this, use this G and then go up to an A and then come back or use this G, come down to an F sharp and come back would be one way of doing it. Um, so that would be a possibility. Let's look at that second measure and see. If I did an upper auxiliary note or an upper neighbor tone. Does that work? This gives it a particular flavor. Does it work better if it's a lower auxiliary note or a lower neighbor tone? possibly works slightly better as a lower than an upper in that case, but it's a question of what you're trying to achieve. Or do you sort of think, well, do I really want to have this part moving at this point while this extra note is happening? Because there's another thing you could do, which is just speed up the process. Say you wanted to use that upper one, but you didn't really want it to happen at the same time as the D and the soprano. Well, how about we do something like this, where we just speed up the process. Um, so we just get it out of the way a little bit and come back to the same note. So you could do that. See, sometimes you're just thinking in beats, but sometimes you could think in half beats and just think, well, if I wanted to tuck in one there, I could do that um, just within the space of that half note, that minimum. I could use a lower one. You could do that. It's up to you. So when you get repeated notes, you might think, ah, the space now with a repeated note to do an upper or a lower, or you could sometimes when you've got longer notes, like half notes onwards, you can think, actually, I've got room here just to do something within a half the time, for example. There are other things you can do, like for example, you might look at the tenor here and say, I wonder if I could do something with that, but that's a fourth, isn't it? Now, when we were talking about these passing notes, these passing tones, I was saying, well, you can use thirds to do that. You can't have a passing tone here that, that maybe just goes from a to B and then to D, because then B to D is not going by step. But you could, for example, do something you know, a little bit wacky it might seem, but by taking that A as a quarter note, and then you could slip in a pair of eighth notes, a pair of quavers, like this. Because it's possible to have two passing notes or two passing tones next door to each other, as long as one is accented and one is unaccented. So you get one that's sort of dissonant on the beat, then is consonant or the other way around. So do you see what I've done in this case? The, the B comes on the beat and it's kind of dissonant with the rest of the chord. It's not part of that 5-7, but it goes on to C that is part of that 5-7. So it's accented passing followed by unaccented passing. So the second bar now does this. Now you might think, well, that's too fussy by far. That's fine. I'm just showing you possibilities here. But, you know, thinking about passing tones or passing notes joining up melodic thirds, also thinking about the possibility when you have a fourth of putting two passing tones or two passing notes, one of which is accented, one of which is unaccented, and also thinking about these opportunities for repeated notes, or even for notes that are long enough for you to move up one and back or to move down one and back.
you know. I mean, even the final chord, for example, you could say, well, I could get to the last chord and do this. So there's a lower in the soprano or an upper in the alto or a lower in the tenor or an upper in the bass. You could do that if you wanted to. You might just think, well, it's the last chord. I'm happy to let that settle. So you've got lots of options. And of course, this is the great thing about music. It's not maths. It's supposed to be creative and imaginative. So you can play around with these embellishments and decide for yourself which one works best for you. Somebody else might come to a different conclusion. That's absolutely fine. But the point of it is, it can take something that you're writing that you think, well, it's all right, but it's a bit kind of plain, a bit kind of bland. Before you ditch it, just think, what happens if I elaborate it? And just think through the sort of possibilities that we've considered here. So just to put all this together, here's the original. And here is our elaborated version. Still the same piece of music, still the same chords, but actually it's quite transformed, isn't it, by that. So hopefully that's going to empower you to think about these non-chord tones and where to use them, how to use them, and then how to make a kind of artistic evaluation of which ones work, which ones maybe don't work so well. Can I use double or even triple of these non-chord tones? Or does there come a point where it gets too congested or the harmony becomes too dissonant? That's all kind of oral judgment. But I hope that's been helpful. If you've enjoyed this video, well, we've got lots of other videos on the channel that are on similar themes dealing with issues of harmony and counterpoint. Um, you may also want to go to our website at www.mmcourses.co.uk where you will find details of all of our courses. And whereas the YouTube channel videos are all one-offs, sort of ducking and diving around various aspects of music, on the website, we've got progressive courses. So you can lock onto a theory course or an oral course or an oral dictation course, an orchestration course, whatever. And you can go A to Z on a journey. Uh, so I'll re lead you through very progressively if you're really wanting to build up knowledge in a much more systematic way. So that's the idea of the courses. While you're on the homepage of the website, just click on Maestros if you have a moment. And Maestros is our international community of musicians, a uh, lovely, lovely group of people, uh, folk who are quite often on their own musical journey, not quite sure where other people are on a similar or parallel musical journey and they just love being part of maestros because apart from the, all the perks of emojis and badges and discounts on stuff that we've got on the course uh, part of the website uh, you also get advanced views of YouTube uh, videos you get access to behind the scenes material and we have a monthly live stream operation couple of live streams every month. One is a kind of fairly solid input of teaching from me where we can go into much more detail on this kind of stuff we're covering here uh, and uh, take the journey in a, in a deeper direction. And the other one is where people submit their own compositions or arrangements or harmony or recorded performances of themselves playing. And I give you one-to-one -one evaluative feedback. And we can share that in the group. We run a live chat. People find that it's very supportive. We learn from each other and it's just a great way of kind of developing in this sort of non-isolated way in which uh, a lot of people struggle. Anyway, it's all there. If it's for you, enjoy having a look at it.